Welcome everyone and uh, good afternoon. I'm Martina Garcia. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation based in London. And I'm delighted today to host and chair this webinar on cybersecurity. Uh, it's very clear that cybersecurity, it's becoming more and more present in our daily lives. We read about it when we read about the war in Ukraine. We get very concerned about the evolution of and the potential for cyber war. We get uh, frustrated when we want to do a payment and it's uh, a bit large and our bank starts asking so many questions about how to do it. <laughs> we all in our, in, in our daily, uh, in, in, in many of our jobs have to go through much more compliance burden because of cybersecurity. We get trained about it. It's really uh, more and more and more present. And I thought that today was a, it's an excellent opportunity. We have a super expert panel. <laughs> to go through the trends, to really try to distinguish the noise from, uh, from the real concerns. And um, um, yeah, I'm extremely happy to be here. Before we start with the panel, I'm going to ask Ophelia to say a few words on housekeeping. So Ophelia, please. Yes, welcome everyone. So first, please send us your, chat, uh, your comments in the chat box. You can find that below in your Zoom bar. Also, next to the chat box, you will see a button that says Q&A. So that one is specifically for your questions. If you send any questions you have via the Q&A box, then we can pick it up much easier. And this way, it doesn't mix up with any comments you might want to leave in the chat box as well. You can also raise your hand. So there's also that option. You can also find that after the chat button in your lower Zoom bar, raise hand. Um, and we can unmute you and let you ask questions verbally should you wish to do that. Thank you. Excellent. So let's start with introductions. Teresa, do you go ahead, please? Okay, thank you so much. And um, to begin, I'm apologizing for the sound of my voice. I've unfortunately been sick this past week, so just getting over it, but um, I don't usually sound this raspy, but it's not your audio connection, it's just my voice. Um, but my name is Teresa Walsh, and I am the head of the intelligence program for FSISAC. Um, so we are a 20 plus year old membership consortium of financial institutions dedicated to cyber risks. And we are present all over the world. Um, I'm based in our London office where we have a, a small but um, good sized um, a number of staff, but we also have offices in Singapore, Australia, and soon to be Canada as well. So, um, you know, we're, we're always working with different types of financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, and others on different types of cyber threats and what we can do about them as well. Great. Adrian? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Adrian Nish, and I manage the uh, cyber portfolio at uh, BA Systems. Um, so I've been at BA since 2010, and uh, I worked in, in cybersecurity the whole time, uh, initially in our incident response area. So I got kind of first-hand knowledge in the, the trenches uh, uh, working uh, to evict cyber attackers from uh, our customer networks. Uh, I then later set up our threat intelligence team, uh, and, and, and most recently I look after uh, strategy and uh, an investment into our, our cybersecurity business. So uh, yeah, delighted to uh, be able to join this panel today. Thank you. David? And uh, David Fairbrush, I'm the Global Head of Cyber Futures for KPMG. Uh, I've also got a couple of other hats. I also chair the National Cyber Resilience Advisory Board for Scotland. And I'm a part-time military reservist. Uh, in a previous life, I used to be the head of cyber and space for the Ministry of Defence in the UK. Well, I think clearly we are in for a treat. So let's start with uh, Russia, Ukraine. Uh, Teresa, we have been uh, told uh, repetitively that there will be a huge increase in cyber attacks. And, uh, but then uh, we are reading in the FT that this is not really the case. What's going on? And uh, how much is that the case? How much no? How much can we expect in other wars cyber to be a key uh, tool of, um, of war? Yeah, it, it's a fantastic question and one that we've been answering quite a bit, as you can imagine, over the past several weeks. Um, but right now, outside of the conflict zone of Ukraine, Russia, 
the financial sector actually isn't seeing that much of an increase of sophisticated attacks. There's always that low level noise that we see on a constant basis. And that changes um, periodically, depending on what's going on in the world. And we, we definitely have seen increases of phishing um, using those types of lures, but we can't say that we've seen you know, the attacks that everybody was expecting. Now, there could be, you know, endless debates. We could probably take up the entire hour talking about why that is or is not. But, um, you know, the reality of it is outside the conflict zone. Um, we really haven't seen that that much. And But we are still monitoring and waiting mm-hmm. and trying to be prepared as much as possible. And, and Adrian, David, please feel free to chip in. But why not? Why, why was the prediction wrong? I think for me, there's a question about focus. Um, So Ukraine has seen a substantial number of cyber attacks mounted against it. We saw that in the the phase running up to the conflict and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, So we saw substantial examples of um, implants being laid down across systems. We saw malware being deployed across a range of those systems and very destructive malware purporting to be classic ransomware which was purely aimed at data destruction. And we have seen some examples of collateral damage. So for instance, we saw an example of satellite communication modems being disrupted outside the theater of the Ukraine as well. But to play to Teresa's point, what we haven't yet seen is that smoking gun other than themed phishing and spear phishing around the Ukrainian conflict, which we always see around a major conflict or event. We haven't seen that much targeting outside. However, However, a lot of trade craft has been used and disclosed. So we've seen a lot of um, cybersecurity advisories from the major NCSEs, national cybersecurity centers around the world, covering a range of sophisticated malware, um, which Mm -hmm. is now being disrupted, added to antivirus monitors. Um, So some of that trade craft has been widely disclosed now by the intelligence services. And what can we expect in the future then in all the conflicts? Is, is, is cyber war, um, you know, 10 years, 50 years? Yeah. I'll, I'll give what, you a what? personal perspective. It'd be, it'd be great to get Adrian's views too. So what we have seen, um, certainly over the last decade, is the build out of offensive cyber capabilities by a number of nation states. Um, sometimes as part of their intelligence services, sometimes as part of the military. And that's included the development and sometimes testing of some quite disruptive cyber attack tools. And if I look at the Ukraine, that was a perfect example of that. So we saw the disruption of their electrical power grid back in 2016, and then again, also 2015 as well. Um, Quite sophisticated malware. So we're seeing that build out. But then when you look at it, um, cyber plays into warfare in a couple of different ways. It plays obviously as a tool of espionage and intelligence collection in the run-up to conflict. It plays in as a deniable tool of power. So one of the things we have seen around the Ukrainian conflict is a lot of non-state activist activities around that. Um, And we've seen groups like Conti, um, a Russian-speaking organized crime group, saying we we will retaliate for any perceived cyber attacks on Russia as part of this conflict. And we've seen President Zelensky calling for the build out of the Ukrainian IT army as well. So we're seeing quite a bit of hacktivist activity where the line between state and political activism is very, very blurred indeed. And Adrian, you've probably seen some of that. Yeah, I think that that's one of the, the, the really interesting aspects of this uh, whole conflict is the, the sort of influence operations that are going on. And, and frankly, the Ukrainians are winning that. I mean, they are much more active at that. Uh, obviously, they have the advantage that they want to get the story out to the, the world and particularly influence uh, the, the, the Russian population, whereas Russia, certainly from the start of the campaign, has had the opposite. It's been trying to keep any uh, mention of this, particularly in Russia, uh, out of the, the public domain uh, and really kind of narrow down the focus on this being just a, a limited special operation, et cetera. Um, but I think in terms of some of the tactics that we're seeing coming out in that influence operation, it's 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 fascinating to watch and it's still very much an evolving, an evolving picture. Uh, Ophelia, are there any questions? 
Yeah, so I think the panel has already done a wonderful job uh, covering cyber warfare <laughs> tactics. There's one question on that. Um, but also another really interesting question is, could the US and other Western nations be targeted? Um, it would be very interesting to hear the panel view. Well, well they're targeted all the time. Um, so that that's nothing new, but I, I guess the, uh, the the prospect of more disruptive, destructive attacks um, uh, is is probably what people are, are watching out for at the moment. And and you know we, we we can only kind of speculate what the motivation might be for doing that. But certainly, kind of testing the resolve of NATO to uh, you know to respond and and then just kind of ratcheting up how disruptive you can be with those attacks. Is 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 something that you know cyber is 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 as as a an offensive tool gives you that that advantage. Um, but you know certainly we're we're well used to seeing intrusions from a kind of espionage or uh, or reconnaissance perspective against uh, against Western networks. I would say probably the one thing that we were all looking out for at the beginning was potentially a repeat of the NotPetya attack. Um, so basically, a, a, what was a, at one point a targeted attack against the against Ukrainian targets that got out of the box and just went rampant and almost shut down global shipping and things like that. So you know, if it had an impact here in the UK, of course, with the NHS, but. Um, that's what we were all worried about is this type of destructive malware um, that could get out of, of hand quite quickly and spread across the world. Luckily, that hasn't happened, even though there have been several wiper malwares discovered in Ukraine, as David pointed out. Well, let's hope things continue that way, huh? And then it, and then it doesn't happen. Um, also, uh, another very interesting question on the topic that I would like to ask is also what will retaliation look like in a cyber war? And um, obviously, you've already covered a bit, but how will artificial intelligence and machine learning factor in, uh, given the Ukraine and Russia situation as well? Oh, well there's, quite, there's quite a few different questions hiding in there, isn't there? So, so what, one of the problems is often that people see it as a symmetrical response, by which I mean, you know, somebody has attacked you through cyberspace, your only response option is to counterattack in cyberspace. And the reality is that's probably not going to be the case in most occasions. So you know, could be back into discussion about political, economic pressure. Um, I think it's highly unlikely you use cyber force to counter cyber force with one little caveat that sometimes, and we've already seen this with organized crime, there will be active measures to take down the infrastructure being used to mount some of those attacks. And typically that might include tearing down um, servers, it might include disrupting botnets that are being used as part of that attack pattern. So there are some things you can do to disrupt and counter that infrastructure being used and built out by the attackers. But I think actually the responses will partly be in the political and economic and further sanctions space to any major cyber attack if it did occur against our infrastructure. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I find that uh, uh, somehow reassuring in a way, because uh, otherwise the idea of having a kind of virtual war and, uh, <laughs> and a physical war separated, it's, uh, 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 yeah. It's, so one of the it, one of the challenges is it gets very very messy because we're seeing non-state actors and state actors both operating in this space. Yeah. You've got the whole question about attribution, and you've got the question about how you control escalation and de-escalation. Yeah. It can get very very messy very yeah. quickly. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting um, as well just to consider what a, a highly sanctioned Russia looks like in yes. you know the the medium to long term and. And I guess the best model we have for that is North Korea. North Korea has been under significant sanctions for a long time, and that has led to behaviors such as uh, the attacks against the financial system, which were all about evading the sanctions to to raise revenue. You know, with with, with the added benefit, you're you're sowing distrust in the financial system, um, but also espionage from North Korea, particularly enabling it to, uh, I guess, fill in gaps mainly in its kind of um, aerospace and defense capabilities, um, Russia will probably face some of those challenges pretty quickly uh, where it comes to things like uh, maintenance of aircraft. So, you know, the the, the manuals that it needs to maintain uh, fleets of Boeing aircraft are, are online and 
well, they've been denied access to that now. So they'll very quickly have a need to access that sort of material and, and, and traditional sort of espionage will be a route for them to do that. That's very interesting. Um, uh, the, 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 yeah, I, I, I have never thought about the behavioral uh, impact of the sanctions on, on, uh, on North Korea in that way and how it, it could apply to Russia. Um, which brings me a little bit to uh, financial services, yes? And uh, I wanted to ask uh, the, uh, David particularly, but obviously also Theresa and Adrian on, on, on that point. I mean, we have a very rapid digitalization of the whole of the financial services, the whole chain. And into that context of uh, 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 rising geopolitical tensions, and as Adrian has explained, uh, uh, probably a much more um, a much bigger drive from a state actor and private actors to uh, to use the uh, cyber tools to get the information they need. Um, is dig are digital financial services intrinsically more vulnerable? Yeah, I think it's a tricky one to respond to. So, of course, if you've got a financial infrastructure that's primarily non-digital, i.e. you're back onto classic branch infrastructure and telephony, um, is it less vulnerable to remote attacks at scale? Potentially, but that's not the world we live in. So the world we live in now is one where we're all used to 24-7 online digital banking services. So the challenge then becomes what, how many layers of protection and also response can you wrap around that? So everybody now is obviously implementing denial of service mitigation techniques, that's commonplace across the financial services sector. But they're also having to look at now how they extend that to cover a broader range of services, such as open APIs and open banking services yeah. too, yeah. because that's now a key part of the future offering. Mm. But there's some other changes um, we're having to navigate our way through. So many financial services institutions are more and more dependent on um, software as a service, more heavily migrated to cloud. And that's introducing a set of new dependencies that we need to try and actually understand. So the financial services sector is becoming increasingly interconnected and interdependent, which creates sometimes supply chain risk issues, where you might find that a single SaaS provider, if compromised, gives you a route into multiple financial institutions. So there's a whole piece here about how we ramp up supply chain security across the community. And I think you mentioned, might come on to it later on, the relationship between government and the financial services sector as mm -hmm. we do that, our respective roles, if you like. And we have seen an increase over the last two to three years in supply chain attacks. So solar winds, Casio would be examples of that. So we are seeing active targeting of supply chains because organized crime and sometimes states have realized it gives you a rapid reach into the community. So if you compromise somebody in that supply chain, then very quickly you can move upstream to their customer base, and that may impact multiple organizations. And then the last piece of the challenge here is for regulators, which is really getting a feel for systemic risk. So obviously all the financial institutions are regulated entities, FCA, PRA, UK, but when you start moving down that supply chain into the fintech space and the managed service provision space, they're not regulated entities. Um, and often there's not much assurance beyond what you can write into contracts of the security measures being implemented in that third party space. So this plays very neatly into the whole operation of resilience debate we're seeing. So we're gonna find ourselves in a position with regulation where both for OPRES in the UK and also for the Digital Operation of Resilience Act in, in the EU, those third party obligations are gonna become increasingly onerous and, and if I look to the UK, managed service providers may also be pulled into the regulatory regime under NIS as well. So you're going to see a lot more concern around supply chain, third party, and how the community works to improve security in that space. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a total shift of uh, the view on uh, stability from uh, uh, post-crisis, post-financial crisis, yes, and who is really systemic. Um, mm -hmm. Totally different uh, points of failure. Very interesting. There is uh, Adrian. Any comment on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, Third-party risk management has been around for a long time for the financial services. We've been 
you know, keenly aware of uh, how interdependent we are of each other. I used to work for two major banks, for instance, and, um, you know, I was even shocked how much we were interconnected with the smaller financial institutions and insurance companies. And, and you know, everything's, everything is very much interconnected. And, and we do realize this. And we, you know, sometimes even look at each other as third parties, uh, but also, of course, the companies that David had mentioned in 2021, we saw you know almost unprecedented amount of third party targeting that was impacting the sector as well. Um, so we were consistently having to react to that. And you know at an FSI sec, we actually have what we call a cyber threat level. And that actually increased three times last year, where in previous years we had almost never increased or had maybe only increased once. Um, so it, it definitely took a different tone for us, and we did realize this was all third party supply chain focused. So it was a, a very you know big wake up call, I think, for the sector to say, you, you've done so much to protect your own house, but what about your neighborhood? What about you know the, the people who are trying to help protect your neighborhood and and so forth? So you know you can only do so much for yourself. You have to expand out. And that's why cooperation and collaboration are so important as well, not just with your third parties, but with public sector partners, for instance, um, you know, uh, in the US they have CISA, just like in the UK they have NCSC. They've been putting out great information and guidance, um, not just to big companies, but to small businesses at large as well. So, and even the everyday citizen understanding cybersecurity better because we are in the age of digitization, aren't we? So, um, you know, COVID I think has really pushed us towards that as well. And we do need to be keenly aware of how we are interconnected. I really liked what David was saying about how the regulators are starting to pay more attention to non-traditional financial institutions. And we definitely have seen that in our space. You know, so much so that we actually created a, a brand new program this year called the Critical uh, Provider Program, and that has recognized non-financial institutions that have that aren't just third parties to any given firm, but third parties to pretty much the entire sector. <laughs> and so we realized that you know we we are a membership organization, so they're not eligible for membership as a financial institution, but they are key to our cyber risk. They are key to understanding uh, potential threats and and disruption to our business operations in the future as well. So that's why we wanted to to embrace that and make sure that we understand each other. We have ways to communicate and collaborate with each other. Yeah. Adrian, do you also see the regulators uh, totally up to speed on that? I'm, I'm going to oh, pass on, saying... on commenting on, on the regulators. It's, ah, not, it's not my area of expertise, but I, okay. I, I, will, I will share a couple of observations on, on criminal behavior that I think is, is maybe pertinent. So um, two, two things. Well, criminals consider return on investment. Yeah, they have to make an investment into building capabilities to target systems so they they consider what is you know the least amount of effort to make the maximum amount of money and and that that leads to certain behavior um we also see evidence of kind of copycat behavior so when certain attacks are successful and they get talked about in the media other criminal groups then cotton on to that and so they tend to kind of follow each other and so this is why we've seen ransomware become such a big thing over the past couple of years I and mean, there's a few other driving factors but it is partly the success has led criminal groups who were previously making lots of money doing other types of attacks all shift to doing ransomware because they see it as lower risk for them and higher reward uh, and, and, and the technique works. So the, the, the point I want to kind of make around digitalization of financial services is that you know we, we shouldn't be so concerned about the, the cyber threats that it stops us adopting these and stops us progressing. There is risk but it doesn't necessarily mean that criminals are going to immediately stop doing other types of attacks that they, uh, you know, that work for them and shift to shift to these. They just have to be harder to attack than other things that criminals are currently doing, and they'll be sufficiently um, uh, dissuaded from going after that. Uh, so we are we are into the you don't have to run faster than the bear, just faster <laughs> than your friend. Exactly. <laughs> okay. yeah. And I think Adrian's point, I think, is a great one. I always described organized crime as being ruthless, rational entrepreneurs. You know, they do do that return on investment calculation. And that means actually they're still targeting, to some extent, mass banking services. But frankly, 
Adrian's spot on. Um, ransomware across the medium-sized corporates is just a softer target just now, um, linked to a decent return on investment of, um, in some form of cryptocurrency. So it is attracting a lot of attention. How expensive it is, this in type term, of crime? In what, to get, of to get into it? Or, uh... <laughs> yeah, not that I want to get into it, be reassured. I was, uh, we've, got, just... we've got some remarkable insights from... Um, a group called Conti, who um, uh, recently their their internal chat logs got leaked, and uh, uh -huh. we get a few kind of uh, high level data points from that. One is that they have made a proxy 180 million over the past few years from victims. Mm -hmm. However, the group have effectively employees, so they're kind of criminal kingpins to the uh -huh. group, and there are there are employees within the group, and the employees get paid. I think it was between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars a month. So you know, maybe not bad uh, wages for whichever part of the world they're in, uh, but not making mega bucks by comparison to some of the um, you know the numbers you've seen thrown around. So um, that 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 leak from that uh, uh, Conti operation is is a fascinating insight into uh, how criminal gangs work. No, no, that's uh, because that type of salary, yes, I mean, some parts of the world, it, it, it's a very respectable salary indeed. But uh, but maybe if you are a top in the field, you might be able to get more in a legal work, in a legal job, no? It's at the top of the organized crime group, they do remarkably well because yeah. it's a franchise model. So they end up taking a, a top slice of all the income from the, the groups who are actually deploying their particular ransomware tools and attack methods. So actually they do remarkably well out of it. Great. Adrian, you were speaking about ransomware. And um, I mean, uh, another moment that we have all heard very much about the risk, the increased risk of, uh, of, of, of cyber and, and ransomware more particularly and phishing is uh, when we all had to work from home, yes? And, uh, you know, that, that was a, a moment where companies got very worried. There was a lot of publicity around, the, around these issues. There was a lot of training. Now, um, and I suppose then you must have seen an increase and it would be great to have your comments. I would also like to, to, see, to have your views on the return to work and whether hybrid is creating a new set of risks or is the risk now diminishing? Yeah, so I mean, it, I guess two sides of it. One, it, it changed criminal uh, behavior because some of the criminals also ended up having to work from home and some of the, the nation state actors also ended up having to work from home. And I guess some of those uh, weren't so able to do hybrid working, so they just, they just stopped. Um, also, some of the groups who relied on kind of moving money across borders, so doing kind of ATM cash outs and then, uh, and then having money mules that can physically move it, that kind of uh, went away. Uh, yeah. And so, so that that partly drove criminals into cryptocurrency, uh, which is another one of the factors that drove the the shift to to ransomware. Um, in terms of the, uh, I guess the sort of victim side, yeah, obviously uh, enabling more remote working has led to more remote accessibility into organisations, including you know administrator level uh, remote access. Which, if you've not secured that properly, the criminals will find it and boom. Uh, organization is uh, is facing something like a, a, a ransomware attack. So yeah, I think I think we've you know we've seen a lot of that play out, um, and it has just enabled some of these groups um, to get more proficient at targeting enterprise organizations. Because remember, you know, criminal groups uh, haven't traditionally always targeted enterprises. Go back mm -hmm. a decade. It was all about stealing individual credit card numbers. You know, Teresa can probably tell you all about some of the the, the various ways that you know criminal groups would steal credit card numbers. Um, but but that's a different sort of modus operandi to actually doing enterprise attacks, which is more getting into the ransomware and things like that. So I think that trend of groups becoming more proficient at enterprise targeting is 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 the kind of uh, thing we need to be concerned about. Um, and and that you know hopefully organizations are learning where they need to kind of lock down their enterprise to, to protect that. Um, but it's still, um, yeah, it, it's still probably with the attackers at the moment in terms of them having the upper hand. 
So who is going to be the next soft target? Because in a way, what you're saying is that uh, these type of medium corporates were the, the ones running less fast. So who, who, who do you think, Teresa, David, who do you think uh, as they get uh, more up to speed, where is the next uh, area of increased vulnerability? Then you, what are your expectations there? I think um, in some cases we still have not a new area of increased vulnerability, but just you know still existing areas where and sectors that are still vulnerable. So there, you know, for instance, there have been a lot of talks about um, utilities, um, so water supplies, electrical grids, and um, you know some of them around the world or very much decentralized or or maybe the opposite maybe they're completely controlled by the state so um they're running off of state budgets but um you, you do have an already I, I think a plethora of sectors and companies that are still addressing basic cyber hygiene issues and then trying to get into the more advanced state of cybersecurity to protect themselves um so you know i think you know, in some ways, we've already been seeing the tides going towards there. There were significant attacks last year against some of these um, companies, Colonial Pipeline attack, for instance, um, that, you know, really did change the game completely in some ways because there was much more government scrutiny on um, some of these actors and, and, and also not just on the actors, but on us as the companies defending against these attacks. And so you have more legislation, more regulation coming out now too. But I think, um, you know, we're still pretty much uh, trying to address all those all those uh, um, uh, companies and trying to get everybody to, to have a more active cyber defense, uh, you know, and, and really follow the guidance that NCSC and others put out. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. So ransomware is still a, um, a massive problem and the business model frankly still works for ransomware so you know the cyber insurance firms i deal with have seen you know significant increases in ransomware claims um but there's things happening around that so some of those groups are ending up on the sanctions list now for instance particularly when they have a state connection north korea as adrian hinted at or or indeed russia so we're seeing that happening but the other thing we're seeing happening is more of a focus on cryptocurrency and the ability of those ransomware groups to effectively convert cryptocurrency to fiat currencies. So we may well find that the disruption of the monetization mechanisms for ransomware attacks are actually one of the more effective ways of dealing with that. Now, you then got a challenge. It's a bit like we squeeze here, it pops out somewhere else. So we then got to see new techniques being developed and new monetization models. And we've been through phases of that. So for instance, you know, we, got, we got to the point where data was big money. Um, data breaches would be sold on, um, rap rapidly exploited in the dark web. Um, and that we managed to crack down on. And also we ended up to the point where there was effectively a glut of data out there as well with minimal additional value coming. That's where ransomware started to come in. We're also still seeing the business email compromise frauds running through. They haven't gone away. Um, so tricking firms into making significant financial contributions. And sometimes we've seen compromises of corporate networks to directly manipulate their financial system. So there'll be other models come along. And as Teresa has hinted, I don't think we've seen the full story play through either on supply chain attacks or on attacks and operational technology systems, particularly sometimes where there's a state connection. So th there's more to come, I think, but at the moment, it'd be great to get Adrian's views. Ransomware is still a comfortable model for many organized crime groups because they're getting a decent return on investment. And a lot of these groups are fundamentally lazy in the sense of if they're making money, why would you stop making money? Yeah, it was one of the things we actually explicitly looked for in the, the Conti chat was whether there was any evidence them targeting operational technology. And mm -hmm. there was no evidence of it. There were some other interesting things which I'll, I'll, I'll bring up though. They, they, there was evidence of them buying uh, um, EDR tools, mm -hmm. on uh, legitimate EDR tools, which they were getting via front companies and uh, and resellers. And obviously, they're, they are then reverse engineering those EDR tools to make sure they understand how they work, to make sure that their attacks are not detected by them. So, you know, when people are surprised that the tools they've invested in aren't 
detecting these common attacks. This is why it's because the, the criminal groups have got to a point. They've also got the tools and they understand how they work and they understand how to defeat them. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult race. Um, I think, yeah, the, the other challenge with kind of um, the, the whole ransomware uh, sort of business model, you know, if we look at some of the previous kind of uh, ways the criminals were doing um, uh, attacks, so, you know, uh, a credit card um, uh, uh, number stealing through various means. I mean, you had the credit card agencies who were able to effectively clamp down on that uh, because they sort of almost act as the regulator in that market. Uh, where we saw uh, kind of web injects into online banking, you know, through better kind of understanding of that, the banks were able to improve their detection and defenses against that. And so that sort of attack stopped effectively. Um, when we had the uh, Bangladesh Bank attack and then the you know subsequent attacks against SWIFT, obviously SWIFT was able to put in the customer security program, raise the defenses, make it harder for the attackers. It's very hard to see how there's some, you know, organization or set of organizations in the financial services industry who can actually impact the ransomware business model because of the nature of cryptocurrency, it's decentralized. And even if we find a way to crack down on Bitcoin, they can just move to Monero. We find a way to crack down on Monero, there'll be something else that uh, that that they're able to leverage. It, it's very hard to see, um, you know, with, without kind of putting extra kind of regulatory pressure on stopping payments um, or, or something else, how we can actually break the business model. So you were not encouraged by the, the, the successes of the U.S. Department of Justice to recover some of the cryptocurrency that had been stolen? It, it's only through mistakes that the attackers have made okay. and they won't make those mistakes again. Mm -hmm. they'll they'll just count that as a you know minor blip in their overall business model and they've they've learned from it by now mm -hmm. and in terms of like the sanctions the indictments yep it's great to be able to you know get somebody onto an interpol red notice so they can't travel but you know they probably accepted that they're probably not going to be able to travel for the rest of their lives and and that's okay that's a that's again just another cost to it um it doesn't really stop the activity that's uh, right. I think then then we we can move uh, on maybe to the to the mitigation strategies and what's new in that area. Yeah. So we have been speaking a lot about uh, the attacks, and we are increasingly speaking about the defense, obviously. Hmm? So uh, maybe Teresa, you, you you might be able to to give us a an, a bit of an overview. You who in your mind is. Um, is the good student in the financial sector and which areas my, uh, uh, in the sector particularly, or as you mentioned in the supply chain, uh, really need to pick up the game. Yeah, it, it's a great point and one that we've devoted our work to basically for the past 20 years is to try to figure out what to do about all these threats and risks out there. And, and really, uh, I, I saw one of the questions was, um, what can we expect next? You know, what kind of attack is going to happen next? And it's very hard to predict that. But at the same time, what we always try to say is that the financial institutions must work together um, because it's the same concept that if you're at Canary Wharf and you see somebody walking towards one of your neighbor banks with, you know, a machine gun, you're going to call the police, you're going to warn them, you're going to say something about it. Same thing in the cyberspace, you know, if you get attacked, more than likely somebody else is getting attacked as well probably by the same perpetrators, maybe by the same malware even. And that's why we do this type of intelligence sharing. So we're, we're trying to talk about what we're seeing ourselves so that others can learn from it. Um, when there is a major attack, you, the two major questions most people ask themselves are, you know, what happened? I, I need to check to see if this is happening to me right now. <laughs> and so that's why they, you know, they're always like asking for, you know, the, the attack pattern and the IOCs and things like that. And the second thing is, what happened? How did they get through? So we can learn from the attack and try to prevent the same thing from happening to us in the future. And so one's a very immediate need of, uh, of trying to address your executive team's questions. <laughs> and the other is you know, the forward thinking of trying to, to adjust your controls for the future. But you can't learn about what 
what actually happened, um, just waiting around for the incident res response team to you know come out with their public blog about it. So you do have to talk to each other. And we've been very lucky that we do have a lot of members that do talk about their security events and incidents and and actually just tell them, you know, tell each other, this is what you need to look out for. This is what we use to mitigate against the attack. It might work for you as well. You know, they're sharing rules that you can put into your, your systems to, to, to watch out for the same type of activity. Um, they're raising their hands saying, we just saw this, make sure that you're looking for the same thing. Um, so for instance, it might be an extortion email for, that might come through and they can give each other advice to say, look in your filters, look in your junk mail, look in even your website forms um, that uh, an extortion message might come through. And, and it gives them each other advice on how to do that. And, um, you know, we do that in a, a several different ways. Sometimes it's socks getting together to talk to each other. Sometimes it's cyber threat intel teams doing the same thing. Other times it's CISOs getting together to say, this is, these are the types of policies we've put into place. This is what we're worried about tomorrow. And we're trying to stem um, today um, to make sure we get in front of it. And then, of course, with the third parties now, the, the conversation is, how do we make sure that as a sector, we understand where our points of concentration are for these suppliers? And as a sector and you know, as, in, as a team, basically, approach those third parties to make sure that they're looking out for the sector. Do they even recognize themselves as critical third parties to our sector? And you, know, the, you would assume that they probably would because they, are, they know what their market share is in the sector, but they might not see themselves as critical infrastructure in that sense. And so that, that's a different type of conversation and actually usually a different set of people you're talking to within those companies. It's not your business account manager. You know, you're talking to maybe their government relations people, their, if they have some sort of risk management people um, talking to them as well. But it's all about collaboration and, and working forward. Public private partnerships is key to, you know, working with, you know, who David used to work with and being able to uh, being able to communicate when attacks are happening or when there is a threat that everybody needs to be aware about. Yep. But when we read the newspaper, sometimes we, that's not what we we are told, no? I mean, I can think of uh, several uh, of the latest payment disruptions in which uh, uh, the banks uh, revealed that they had been uh, under attack many months after the attack had happened. Um, do you think that's uh, uh, less prevalent now? Do you, do you see uh, a, a trend in the right direction at that level? Well, it always depends on how it's communicated. Um, we operate a closed um, system. It's a peer community, basically. So um, we have something called the Traffic Light Protocol. And um, if it's TLP White, for instance, that's okay to blog about, that's okay to tweet about, uh, whatever you might have. Um, but usually what you're talking about is um, is more for the security practitioners to understand and learn from each other. Now, every company has um, due diligence that they must do for every incident that they have. Um, they must investigate. They must, in some cases, have an independent investigator coming in, whether or not it's a you know, a, a, a something to do with the personal data of your customers or, or an actual enterprise attack against your system. But you do have a certain amount of compliance that you have to, um, to do. And so that will often have a state, a phase where nobody can actually say anything because you just don't know at that point. <laughs> you know, you don't know exactly what happened. You're still investigating it. And you do have to go through the motions for whatever compliance you have to go through. Um, and, and so that is something that I think the general public doesn't understand uh, at, at times. But, but behind the scenes, there might be talks of maybe the some type of behavior they saw, maybe a strange phishing email, maybe an IOC that they can share. And those are the things that we try to facilitate as much as possible and privately as well, because our main concern is the mutual defense of the sector to make sure that the financial sector is still operating and can still serve its customers. Um, but yes, when it comes to an individual incident, they, they do have quite a bit that they have to do before they can go public with it. Interesting. David, Adrian, apart from mutual defense, what are the other key strategies that need to improve? 
Well, I think we've seen a, a bit of an evolution of cybersecurity over the years. So, you know, if I wind the clock back a little, uh, we started with very much with a protective approach to security, where it would be a function of multiple layers of defenses. Then we saw a greater emphasis on improved detection capability, reducing the time to detect particularly. So for some of the ransomware attacks we've been talking about, two years ago, we would have found an attacker perhaps active in a network for about two weeks between the initial point of access and the deployment and the triggering of the ransomware. That time scale is coming down and down and down just now. As some of the attackers begin to automate some of their own tooling. Um, so we're down now typically to three to four days. So that places a premium on quickly detecting any intrusion or an unusual behavior within your environment and also automating aspects of the response as well. So you can do rapid containment of any compromised system. So there's a whole piece of detect and respond. But the other big shift is back onto this resilience point I mentioned earlier. So the whole Operation Resilience agenda in the UK financial institutions is driven from the starting premise that you have been compromised and there has been a major disruption of your operations and focuses more on two things. How do you accelerate your recovery once the incidents actually occurred? So how do you rebuild your IT environment, restore key data, get back in business as quickly as possible? And the second part, which is how do you mitigate harm to customers during that oh. process? So how do you get cash to vulnerable customers? How do you respond to customer complaints and triage those quickly and get back to some form of basic service provision? So what we're seeing, I think, is a more balanced approach including how do you deal with those extreme events? And that's triggering some discussions we've seen in the US in the past, because the US has the concept of sheltered harbor, where your know, banks effectively deposit a snapshot of their um, account state and transaction information that allows that to be recovered, and sometimes for a third party to actually provide a basic banking service. So we're beginning to get back into those sort of discussions in the UK as well, about rapid recovery and reconstitution of the service. So not just cybersecurity, but resilience. Yep. Yep. Adrian, any comments? Yeah, I'll probably just make a, a plug for uh, security testing. So um, obviously, you know, all organizations know they need to do some level of testing, whether that's just on kind of um, uh, release of new applications uh, or sort of ongoing vulnerability management. Um, but there's definitely a need for proper kind of red teaming where you give a uh, a set of ethical testers uh, relatively free reign to find the holes across the network and uh, and use the techniques that we see the criminal groups using and the tools that we see the criminal groups using um, uh, to actually test the defences. And a good a good well done test can kind of you know ratchet up the the level of sophistication you know to see okay well. You know, if you're or, or or take it down a level to see, okay, well, you're not detecting this, but can you detect, uh, you know, if I do something a little bit more noisy to actually give the defending organization an understanding of actually, okay, where their level of detection is at, uh, and then you know, put in place a, a program of, uh, of of improving defenses from there. So yeah, consider red teaming. Uh, look to get a good uh, company who understands the threat landscape, understands how these. Uh, actors operate and, and try and emulate the techniques they're using. And I build on Adrian's point. The, the other thing well worth doing, and, and pretty much everybody does this at one level, is uh, crisis exercising as well at senior level. So just if the worst does happen, how do you mobilize quickly? How do you make the right decisions under pressure? And have you really, really thought about some of your response options if this mm -hmm. incident really does happen to you? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing off of what David had mentioned too, is that um, um, recently I had a chance to to see a talk in person actually, uh, which is probably why I'm sick, but, <laughs> but I've been able to see a talk about uh, um, the NIST framework and what they call the cyber defense matrix, which was built by um, a, a data scientist from one of the banks. And um, they had shown how, if you look at the, the NIST framework, most of all the products out there are all on the left-hand side 
of identify and you know detect and yeah. things like that, but not so much on the recover phase and the respond phase. And that's where you do need to exercise it out to understand how are you going to respond to an incident, but also how are you going to recover from it? And, and Sheltered Harbor is actually one of our um, subsidiaries. So um, you know we do um, we do always try to say to to look at the right side of the spectrum as much as possible as well because you want to do as much as you can to prepare, but I think I don't think anybody would say they're a hundred percent certain that nothing will ever happen to them like, in the future. So you do have to prepare for that for that black swan event for your company. You do have to prepare for um, your teams about how they're going to communicate with each other, with the regulator, with the media, and to their customers as well. So it, there's a lot of facets involved on that right hand side of uh, you know, respond and, uh, and restore as well. So you do need to, to think about all that. Yeah, yeah. I think companies do now, increasingly so. I have done that as a, an employee, not of the CSFI, but uh, uh, of uh, my, previous, uh, my previous employers, I have done the exercise several times. Very good. Um, yeah. <laughs> she gets the gold star. <laughs> ah, it wasn't me leading it. It was me being <laughs> subject to it. Which brings me to the um, one point that I really want to discuss, which is who has responsibility for the protection? Yes? No? Well, I mean, and, uh, and I'm... I really want to discuss the, the, the split between government and corporates because we have been speaking a lot about the corporates. I was personally very struck by some of the new uh, legislation in Australia, uh, um, making it compulsory for uh, uh, systemic uh, institutions, not in the financial sector, but uh, you know, critical uh, institutions to, uh, to up their game and invest heavily in cybersecurity. Um, I'm also a, a consumer well, and uh, I find it increasingly difficult to make a payment with uh, the app, with my app that is a little bit out of normal payments well, and very irritating. And, uh, and you know, we recently at CSFI, we had a whole uh, session on sludge, which is the additional bureau bureaucracy then all of us face and how, when you add it up all up, it starts to be quite meaningful. You know? and, uh, and so I, I really wanted to have uh, this discussion and maybe starting with uh, David you know, on who has to drive the effort, yes? And, uh, and what are the responsibilities of uh, government, of uh, uh, the financial institutions and of consumers? How to split the pie of the cost? Wow. Um, we have to cover this in seven minutes as a group. Right, yes, let's go for and it. I have spoken far too long. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. <clears throat> okay. So it's a classic one because, in theory, government should have no role. Unfortunately, uh, we have a number of market failures operating, as uh, Kieran Martin used to describe it from the NCSC. So, what, one of the challenges here is um, government will end up driving additional regulatory interventions in this space. So they've already got Network and Information Security Directive from the EU, which we transcribed into UK legislation covering critical infrastructure security standards. That's already in place. The Operation Resilience Regulations are driving a change in behaviour as well, to focus a little bit, as Theresa hinted, at the right of that NIST framework, so into respond and recover. Government's also doing something else, which is interesting. Um, it's the active defense piece. So one of the challenges we run into, uh, well, government had this time, is small and medium-sized enterprises were struggling to deal with security, often limited IT staff, maybe not even any security staff at all, very heavily depend on their managed service providers typically as well, um, and actually therefore quite exposed. And often they'd be in the supply chain. So you're back into this community point that Teresa mentioned. Mm -hmm. So the active defense program the NCSC set up is over four years ago now, has grown to be probably one of the most successful programs. And the way I tend to think about that is it's government almost putting up a protective umbrella across that wider community, including SMEs, small medium-sized enterprises, and individuals as well. So the sorts of things that are in there are you, know, you can now re report your spam emails into the NCSC. They'll do pattern analysis rapidly. 
they're, they're automating and streamlining the takedown process for um, websites that look suspect or dubious. They're scanning government websites automatically to pick up vulnerabilities and issues and dealing with those. And they're offering uh, protected DNS services as well, which automatically um, try to block uh, when you try and access a website that must be might be suspect. And they're allowing you to put your address range into a monitoring service. So if they see any unusual activity originating from inside your network address range, they'll alert to warn you about it. And all of that is about government saying, um, yes, ideally the market would take care of all this and we'd have transparency around the level of security and that'd be priced into people's shares, into credit ratings for organizations. We're not quite there yet. And the cyber insurance market is still immature. So it's still trying to re-level given the current ransomware attacks we're seeing. But government is then stepping in to do both drive regulation, including protecting consumers, and that's on the statute books now, but also, frankly, erecting that umbrella to try and protect the small firms and individuals who just don't have the capability to do this themselves. And that's probably the most effective piece. Yeah. Now, David, you are saying then that ideally the, the government shouldn't have a role, but policing and defense and army. I mean, you cannot get a more traditional role for governments than ah, that. So what a, is the difference? a slightly different piece. So what okay. I, I was okay. referring to is in an ideal world, the market would price security and would drive the incentives around it for people to produce secure trusted offerings. We're not there yet for a whole range of reasons. One, because it's not transparent. So at the moment, it's very difficult for somebody to say, I, I know how secure this firm actually is. And therefore I can make any decisions whatsoever based on the level of trust I have in that firm. We're nowhere near there yet. There's not that level of transparency around <coughs> cybersecurity. So, but of course, government will always have a defense role, ultimately. Although defense and cyberspace is tricky to define and blurs the boundary in the UK neatly between GCHQ and the Ministry of Defense's roles. And the police role is never going to go away, but is also one of the biggest challenges because there are fundamental issues about the skills, levels, and capacity across our police force to deal with the rise in cybercrime. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, Martina, I think um, what you had mentioned before about the monopoly on physical security, it's actually not a monopoly, though. There's still a level of public-private cooperation. So, for instance, if you walk into your neighborhood bank, you don't see MI5 standing there. You don't see the Met Police standing there. You see a privately, you know, a private company security guard. Um, you know, the, the bank tellers might have gotten training on how to do basic physical security from a private company. So there is that level of cooperation still. So in London, for instance, if, you know, again, in the Canary Wharf example, if you're walking to, into a bank branch at Canary Wharf, they probably have a, uh, a private security guard inside. But if something does happen, you know, it might be the Met Police or uh, not quite City London Police, but Met Police re responding. And then if it was something very high level, maybe even the National Crime Agency coming in as well. So um, there is that level of cooperation and it has to be the same way in cyber too. So I think we're in cyber, we want to see a level of guidance and recommendations, support to the smaller uh, uh, institutions that don't have the large cybersecurity teams. But again, it must be a cooperation. It can't be overly prescriptive. So I, you know, I worked for two different banks. In some ways on the outside, they seem very similar. But on the inside, when you look at their IT infrastructure, um, legacy systems, which is always a problem, they were quite different. And one size would not fit all. What worked for one bank would not work for the other bank. And even though on the outside, they looked almost exactly the same in terms of their makeup, they were very different. And imagine if you put that next to an insurance company or a hedge fund, and you're always battling with the eternal problem of, customer satisfaction as well, because you just said it, Martina, before, that you always have problems with your mobile banking app and it frustrates you. But maybe your bank is really, really secure and really, really, really? paranoid about fraud. And you decide to make a choice to go to another bank that has zero friction, so you can use it wherever you want, but maybe it's less secure. 
And you as a consumer prefer that because you can use it anywhere, but it's the day that something does happen that suddenly security and what your bank is doing security wise, you know, rapidly comes right in front of your face as well. Right. We, Jan, last thoughts and we finish. I you think, think, have the privilege think, of wrapping up. Yeah. So I think the big Thank challenge you. for government is, is of course, uh, government is slow. It's always slow. Even when it knows what the right thing to do is, it's slow. And the criminals are not. They're very agile. So government keeping up with the, the fast-moving pace uh, to help defend the private sector, unfortunately, I'd, I, th I think they're going to lose that race. And so it, the private sector does need to just take on it, responsibility itself for keeping on top of this, uh, you know, using the best uh, available tools and processes and lessons learned that are out there and, you know, not ignoring it, not digging their heads in the sand and, and thinking it's just going to happen to somebody else. Just before summing up, we also have a question from Dominique, which looks very interesting if you'd like to pick that up as well. Does the panel think cyber insurance is really of any value at all? Um, Dominique is asking. Yes, but it has limitations. Um, so, a quick plotted version. One of the most powerful things cyber insurance gives you is actually assistance in the instant response support if you do have a major cyber incident. Um, so they'll mobilize quickly, they'll have panels of instant responders on there, uh, and it gives you access to that expert skill quickly in crisis. That's actually one of the most powerful things for cyber insurance. Of course, it's gonna cover aspects of losses, business interruption, maybe in brand and reputation and repairs, system upgrades sometimes, some, some of that will be covered. But the challenge, increasingly is cyber insurers are having to reprice their policies based on the level of instance they're seeing across the community just now and the risk they're carrying in their portfolios. So we're going to see more exceptions language appearing in cyber insurance policies around extreme events, particularly those that are attributable to nation state as well, or are systemic in impacting large numbers of organizations across the, the sector as well. So you're going to find cyber insurance will sort of position in the middle ground. So if it's a small event, you're just going to deal with it and self-insure. Then there's going to be a band where cyber insurance will be uh, able to cover those losses or partially cover those losses. And then there's going to be some extreme events which will be uninsurable. I'll just say simply that it should not be your plan A for security. <laughs> it should it's be somebody. your backup. <laughs> Good. Thank you very, very much. This has been incredibly interesting. And uh, but me, at least I have learned a lot. Yeah. So um, thanks very much. And I hope we will have the occasion to have uh, other discussions on the subject soon. Thank you. <laughs>